Disinformation is a form of online abuse that has recently become prolific. It involves the intentional spread of false or misleading information to achieve some social, political, or financial goal. A defining characteristic is the intent to manipulate the beliefs or behavior of victims. Online platforms, which host content and services for others, have seen a significant rise in disinformation, and recently they've recognized it as a form of online abuse and a serious threat. Their response has prominently included content warnings, the point of which is to help users avoid being misled. But as the security community knows, developing effective warnings is hard. Security researchers have figured out how to design effective warnings, but platforms haven't yet. Our research aimed to adapt warnings for disinformation by drawing on usable security literature that was remarkably successful at advancing security warnings and user safety. Facebook was the first to deploy disinformation warnings back in 2016. These disputed warnings would surface third-party fact checks on posts. Twitter later followed suit, as did search engines like Bing and Google, and other social platforms like Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Most warnings have hewed close to Facebook's original designs, contextual warnings placed alongside content containing fact checks or other context. For platforms, warnings are an appealing counter disinformation response, particularly as an alternative to taking down or limiting the reach of content. Unilaterally restricting content can raise concerns around political speech and free press, especially when disinformation comes from well-known political figures or quasi-news outlets. Warnings are a softer touch that can inform users while leaving content available. And there's reason to believe that warnings can make it easier to resist or correct misbeliefs. Psychology research has observed this for decades, looking at other kinds of false information, like inaccurate courtroom testimony. Recently, new research has looked at disinformation warnings in modern contexts, like social media and online news. These laboratory studies typically involve showing subjects some real news and some fake news, with warnings on some of the fake news. Researchers ask the subjects about accuracy and whether they would share the stories on social media. The studies have mostly looked at contextual warnings, displayed inline next to the content. And primarily, they've looked at the Facebook-style disputed warnings. This work shows that the warnings have modest effects, and those effects are dominated by other factors, like repeated exposure. A number of studies found null or insignificant effects. And these findings align with the little we know about how platforms' warnings are working out in the real world. Not well. Platforms have been criticized for this failure, and more broadly for putting so much emphasis on warnings, which critics argue create the perception of action while doing little to protect users. Our research asks whether disinformation warnings can protect users, and specifically, whether they can affect user beliefs and behavior. Although the evidence presented here is discouraging, we know from usable security research that this is possible for other forms of online abuse. That research concerns browser warnings, which are essential tools for protecting users against phishing, man-in-the-middle attacks, malware, and other threats. Browsers can often detect dangerous websites, but don't always want to block them because false positives can occur due to misclassification or misconfigurations. Warnings provide deterrence while allowing for user override when necessary. The key behavioral metric devised by security researchers was click-through rate, the proportion of warning encounters where users continue past the warning. And by this metric, early security warnings categorically failed. The first study of browser warnings found a 70% click-through rate for phishing warnings of the day, which would appear as browser toolbars. Over the next decade, usable security researchers studied warning effects using surveys, supervised tasks, and eventually large-scale field studies, the most recent of which found only a 10 to 25% click-through rate for modern malware and phishing warnings. Now, the threats these warnings protect against are different from disinformation, especially in terms of immediate risk to the individual. But there are also clearly parallels, and the research has relevant lessons for disinformation warnings. One key insight is about the qualities of effective warnings. They must be noticeable, so users see them, credible, so users believe them, and motivating, so users take the intended action. Another important finding is about ecological validity. Security researchers learned to carefully design realistic experimental tasks where subjects used the real software tools they use in real life and are forced to make meaningful risk decisions. Finally, security research thoroughly concluded that interstitial warnings are more effective than contextuals. An interstitial warning is one that interrupts the user's action and prompts an affirmative decision. One key study found a 21% click-through rate for interstitial warnings compared to 87% for contextuals. As anyone who uses a major modern browser knows, interstitial warnings are the standard for security. Our research draws heavily on these findings, 
we aim to empirically evaluate interstitial and contextual disinformation warnings to answer three questions. First, would users notice the warnings and would they actually read and comprehend what the warnings were telling them? Second, how would warnings affect user behavior and not reported behavior, but actual behavior? Finally, how do different messaging strategies affect user behavior differently? We developed two studies to answer these questions. First, a small scale qualitative study, then a larger scale quantitative study. For the qualitative study, we recruited 40 student participants. They each searched for four facts using Google search in a Chrome browser. And in two rounds, they saw warnings, either a contextual or an interstitial. We adapted those warning designs from Google's warnings, which are generally representative of current search and browser warning designs. And we chose the study search rather than social media because we could create a plausible scenario to directly observe user decisions. Simulating a realistic social media feed is hard. And as a result, laboratory research usually only asks users how they might respond to a warning. Now, the goal of each task in our study was to retrieve a simple fact that could easily be found with a single Google search, but that our participants wouldn't likely know. One example is, what is the political party of the newly elected premier of Taiwan? We told subjects to use a particular source with the option to use another for any reason if they wanted to. We took broad notes and measured two behaviors, click through and a new metric, alternative visits. The alternative visit rate or AVR measures how often users checked the secondary source after checking the primary source. We devised this behavioral metric to measure users trust in the information retrieved from a given source. And finally, we conducted semi-structured interviews after the tasks were complete. In terms of behavior, more subjects clicked through the contextual than the interstitial, 33 compared to 18. For the contextual, notice and comprehension were middling. Four subjects didn't notice the warnings at all, and nine more saw the icon but not the message, meaning they didn't know what the warning was about. For the interstitial, eight subjects didn't recognize that the warning was about disinformation. Although interestingly, seven of those still chose to go back and try the secondary source. This tells us that even though the interstitial performed well, the link between comprehension and behavior was tenuous. Only half of the alternative visits came from users who understood that the warning was about disinformation. Through interviews, we identified three mechanisms of effect. The first was informativeness, subjects who understood the warning and chose to look for a more legitimate source. The second was fear of harm. Users found the warning threatening and thought they or their computer was at risk of harm. And finally, friction. Some users found it easier to go back and pick a different result, hopefully with no warning, instead of reading the warning and deciding whether to listen to it. Based on these findings, we designed a second study to look more closely at interstitial warnings and examine these different mechanisms of effect. In particular, we wanted to see if the interstitial effect was significant in a larger, more diverse population. We also wanted to create warning designs that evinced two of our effect mechanisms, informativeness and fear of harm, and see if there was a difference in their effects. Finally, we also examined the moderating effect of political partisanship on warning efficacy. Political science research suggests that partisanship does affect judgments of information credibility and the efficacy of content warnings. Like the first study, subjects completed four search tasks, encountering warnings in two of those tasks. Because our subjects were crowd workers, we used a simulated search tool instead of real Google search. We controlled queries and results and could remotely monitor users' clicks. Instead of just two warnings, we designed eight, four for informativeness and four for harm. The base designs were drawn from Google Chrome warnings, and we varied text and iconography for each design. Then we used a multi-armed banded algorithm to adaptively assign warnings to users based on how informative and how threatening users found the warnings. Our goal here was to allocate more users to the warnings that best and worst evinced each theory. We measured how users perceived these factors using surveys after each warning encounter. And we also offered bonus payments to users who found the correct answer for the search tasks. The bonus created an incentive for users to consider the trustworthiness and accuracy of information from different sources, similar to incentives used in usable security studies to create meaningful risk decisions for subjects. Finally, just as in the laboratory, we measured two outcomes, click-through rate and alternative visit rate. Across all treatments, interstitial warnings had a robust and significant effect on AVR. We also identified top and bottom performing designs for both theories of effect. Focusing on informativeness, there was one warning liberals gave very high mean ratings of 1.41 on a scale from minus two to positive two. Conservatives selected a different design as the most informative and gave it 
This tells us that it's possible to design interstitial warnings that reliably convey to users that they might encounter disinformation. When we compared the most informative warnings to the least informative, and the most threatening to the least threatening, we found no significant difference in AVR. All the warnings pretty much perform the same. This means that neither mechanism we studied explains the behavioral effect. More on that shortly. We draw three conclusions from our studies. First, contextual warnings, which platforms are currently using widely, are easy for users to overlook and may have minimal effect on behavior. But interstitial warnings can grab user attention, inform them they're encountering disinformation, and change their behavior. But we also service a potential dilemma. Interstitial warnings might be able to inform users and guide behavior, but the behavioral effects might not result from informed decision making. This could undermine the rationale for using disinformation warnings, which is that they change user behavior by informing instead of restricting. To examine this dilemma, we need more research on disinformation warning effects, especially more behavioral research. Measurement needs to move beyond surveys and self-reporting to empirical observation in the laboratory and also at scale in the field. Given that disinformation is a massive challenge of online abuse and trust, the security community should get involved in this research and not leave it all to the political scientists. Security researchers have a valuable toolkit and perspective for this important problem. But the bulk of the work going forward falls on platforms who have a responsibility to devise effective warnings, not just use warnings as a fig leaf. Some platforms like Twitter are sparingly using interstitial warnings now, and this is a good first step, but there's much more that platforms can do. They should release data, conduct internal evaluations, and collaborate with researchers to enable field studies. These are the strategies that worked when browser vendors needed to develop effective security warnings, and they can also help platforms advance their capacity to counter disinformation with warnings. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators without whom this work would not have been possible, and I extend all of our gratitude to the Usenix organizers, reviewers, and our shepherd. Thank you.